This is the longest squid in the world. It's called the giant squid, and it can stretch up to 45 feet long, which is longer than a school bus. Everyone's heard of the giant squids from stories of krakens or other deep sea monsters, but what most people don't know is, the giant squid isn't the largest squid in the world. Because evolution decided to create a squid that, while not longer, is way heavier than the giant squid. Meaning each of these massive creatures has over double the total squid in its body. This creature is none other than the colossal squid. And while you might think there's some closely related species to giant squids, they're actually not related at all? Not only are they not the same species, but they're not the same genus, and not even part of the same family. Their first shared level of classification is their order, with both squids being part of Ogopsida, deep sea squids that live in the open ocean. Yet, these two squids are the only two squids in the world that have reached such massive size to truly be considered giant, or, well, colossal. All other large squids are either long but weigh almost nothing, or are thick fellas, being short and still only reaching a max of 150 pounds. What makes it even weirder is that these squids live in completely different parts of the world, and have never even interacted once. They don't even know each other exists. How is this possible that two absolutely massive squid species evolve completely separately, in totally different oceans, without ever crossing paths? And what would it take for a third truly gigantic squid to be created? Even though these are the only two truly massive squids in the world, and the average person would probably mistake them for being the exact same species, if you actually take a close look, these squids are totally unmistakably different to any guy who knows a thing or two about squids. And for some reason, that guy is me. What's interesting is both these squids do share a common ancestor, likely a primitive Ogiopsid squid that lived around 60 to 100 million years ago, near the end of the Cretaceous period. But in reality, we can't confirm this because we don't really know anything about ancient squids. Squids aren't necessarily the best at leaving fossil evidence, namely because of how squishy they are. Squids don't have any bones, so all that soft tissue is usually gone after just a few weeks, let alone lasting a hundred million years. There is one part of the squid that can remain, which is its beak, essentially the only hard part of the squid. If buried quick enough, they can last for millions of years, which can give clues about ancient squids. At some point after the age of the dinosaurs, the ancient Ogiopsid lineage divided into separate families. One branch led to the Archaeuthidae, the group that would eventually create the giant squid, while another evolved into the Cranchidae, the glass squids, which include the colossal squid. What's interesting is that while both species ended up enormous, they didn't inherit their size from a shared giant ancestor. Instead, they each evolved gigantism independently, a textbook example of what scientists call convergent evolution. What that means is essentially two unrelated species start to evolve similar structures because they're adapting to the same environment, or the same challenge. They aren't copying each other, but nature is just evolving to literally create the same animal, twice. Evolution is basically following the rule of, if it works, don't change it. But you're probably wondering, if they're a case of convergent evolution, why do they still have so many differences? Well, if you watched our video about polar gigantism, you'd know that colossal squids didn't actually get so big for the same reason as giant squids. Colossals live exclusively in the deepest parts of the Antarctic Oceans, whereas giant squids are usually more in temperate oceans and much more widely spread out. Giant squids got large through deep sea gigantism, the phenomenon where animals living in the high pressure, low light depths of the ocean tend to grow larger. Colossal squids also live deep, actually even deeper than giant squids, but most of their size is due to a different effect called polar gigantism, the phenomenon where animals in cold water evolve to grow larger. So does this even count as convergent evolution, if their gigantism is for different reasons? Well, yes, but with a twist. It's still a case of convergent evolution since they both shared a common ancestor and developed gigantism. But this is also partly because colossal squids were influenced by deep sea gigantism too. Even though polar gigantism played the biggest role in colossals, they still live in the deep sea. So the pressures of the deep shaped their size as well. And that's exactly why it's convergent evolution, since they both converged to become giants. And this isn't just because it makes them into super sick kraken monsters, gigantism actually solves a ton of problems for them. 
A larger body conserves energy more efficiently, stores oxygen for longer dives, regulates temperature better in the cold, and most obviously, scares off any predators and turns them into the predator. But since their environments aren't exactly the same, they didn't end up completely identical. Take a look at their bodies here. They're both obviously long, but giant squid's tentacles reach much further. However, the average one is only about 500 pounds, which, fair enough, is still a behemoth for a squid, but compared to colossals, they're less than half the weight. Some of the biggest colossals are reaching up to 1,300 pounds, making them by far the heaviest invertebrate on the Earth, with zero exceptions. The giant squid is long, sleek, and designed to be fast. Colossal squids, on the other hand, are much more chunky, and even though they're still long, they're shaped much more like a tank. While we don't know the exact values due to how difficult it is to find these guys, it's estimated that giant squids can reach speeds of 25 miles per hour using jet propulsion. It's the same type of jet propulsion that small squids use, just this one is taking in a lot more water and shooting out a lot harder. Jet propulsion is actually universal to all squids no matter what their size, which means that colossal squids also have this ability. But since they're so massive, or should I say colossal, they're likely not as fast and only reach about 12 miles per hour. So why did they evolve to have these differences? Why did the giant squid evolve into a graceful giant, but the colossal is just a big fat tank? Well, again, it's convergent evolution, but they haven't fully converged. Their environments are still different, and they've become accustomed to be specialized kraken monsters, but just in their own habitat. The giant squid evolved in open, temperate oceans, areas where prey can move fast. To survive there, being quick mattered more than being tough. The giant squid's long, aerodynamic body and lightweight frame makes it amazing for hunting. It hides in the dark, spots movement with its huge eyes, and rockets forward to snatch prey before it escapes. Speed and reach are its entire strategy. Even just looking at their tentacles show how evolution made them different. They have suction cups with tiny saw-like teeth on them, obviously specialized for gripping slippery prey. And this is provided in their diet, since they eat fast fish like grenadiers or even other smaller giant squids. But in the total opposite environment, the colossal squid, like most things in the Antarctic Ocean, aren't speeding around in super cold waters. Energy conservation is everything in the Antarctic, so instead of wasting energy chasing things, the colossal evolved to endure. Its thick, muscular body helps retain heat even better and store more energy. And when something does get close, it can much easier guarantee that it's going to catch it. They don't really chase or hunt like giant squids. They just kind of sit and wait, and then strike when something is near. The rotating hooks on its tentacles are designed to lock on something once, like a giant Antarctic toothfish, and make sure it doesn't escape. Instead of needing to catch slippery prey, they need to catch other strong, tank-like prey, and out-tank them with impaling hooks. What's also interesting is that both the giant squid and the colossal squid evolve beaks for the same fundamental reason, which is that survival in the deep sea demands a compact, powerful, and efficient way to kill and eat. Down there, prey often has thick scales or armor, and there's no solid surface to pin it against since they live in the open ocean. A squid can't chew or tear like a shark, it needs a way to rip through flesh while holding its prey suspended in open water. The beak solves that perfectly. It's made of chitin, the same material as insect shells, but layered and hardened into something stronger than bone. The sharp upper and lower halves work like a parrot's beak, slicing through muscle and bone with almost no effort. Once the beak cuts the prey apart, the squid's radula, a tongue covered in backwards pointing teeth, grinds it down before swallowing. But what would happen if giant squids started going to the Antarctic? Would they start becoming heavier and develop hooks and morphing into colossals? Well, obviously evolution wouldn't happen this quickly, but even if somehow a giant squid went to an Antarctic Ocean, it would never come across a colossal squid, because even though they're both deep sea creatures, colossals live thousands of meters deeper. Colossals are a part of the abyssal zone, whereas giant squids live more in the midnight zone, still essentially pitch black, but definitely different environments. It's a little sad to think, but colossals and giant squids will never know they have another huge squid cousin. And maybe that's okay, because they'd probably just eat each other anyways. But oddly enough, there is one creature aware that both these squids exist besides us. The sperm whale. Sperm whales are the only predators large enough, 
strong enough, and dive deep enough to regularly hunt both species. They go down thousands of feet into total darkness, guided only by echolocation to find these massive squids. Scars from suction cups and hooks have been found all over their heads, and inside whale stomachs, scientists have found beaks from both giant and colossal squids, the only parts that can't be digested. In the sperm whale's mind, convergent evolution is actually perfect. The more absolutely monstrous squid species that evolve, the better, since they can just continue to dive deep and snarf them up. They don't really care whether the squids have hooks or suckers, or are 500 or 1000 pounds, they just want to find a massive squishy meal and eat it. And this is one fault of convergent evolution. If they converge and make the same animal that seems to work, they'll usually share the same weakness. And in this case, it's sperm whales. What happens is an arms race where these squids continue to get larger and faster to avoid being eaten, while sperm whales continue evolving to be able to dive deeper and hold their breath longer to hunt more squids. They both push each other to their limits, but they also have to stay in the constraints of other normal challenges of their environment. Convergent evolution isn't really about making more cool giant monsters, or even because nature is too lazy to come up with something better. It's that the giant squid monster design works. We've seen this effect in many other animals too. Sharks and dolphins both ended up with the same torpedo-shaped bodies for fast swimming, even though one's a fish and the other's a mammal. Bats and birds both evolved wings completely separately. Even in Australia, there was once a marsupial wolf that looked almost identical to real wolves despite being about as related to them as we are to kangaroos. These creatures are obviously still different though. Sharks breathe with gills and dolphin breathe air with lungs. Bats stretch their skin across their fingers to get wings, whereas birds grew feathers. Giant squids evolved massive bodies but suckers tentacles, whereas colossals evolved massive bodies but hooking tentacles. Evolution is constantly developing new blueprints for these working designs. It's also why some animals go extinct too. Designs that worked but weren't perfect, or worked but stopped working due to a new factor. Well, another reason they could go extinct is because of human actions, but that's a story for another day. But all the animals we see today are designs of life forms that work, which includes the absolutely massive squid design. So, what would it take for a third squid that uses the massive squid design to evolve? Basically, the same conditions that made the first two. You need an environment that's dark, or cold, or full of pressure, or all of the above. And honestly, we might already be seeing early versions of that happening. There are a few lesser known squids that seem like they're halfway there. Like the Dana octopus squid, which are short and wide but cap at around 350 pounds. Or the robust clubhook squid, which can reach around 13 feet long. Nowhere near as truly large as the giant and colossal squids, but you can clearly start to see minor levels of gigantism effects. It's possible that if you throw some squids in the deep sea and force them to adapt, in millions of years you might see something come out of it called like an absolutely huge squid, or immensely large squid. I'm not the best with naming these things. Last thing I wanted to mention, we just hit 20,000 subscribers. So I wanted to thank you guys again for all the support. Please leave me feedback in the comments for anything you want me to cover. I read all the comments you guys leave. And if you want to see our video on polar gigantism, check it out here.